welcome to In the Envelope, a podcast from Backstage, the one-stop shop for actors and creators both above and below the line. I am your host, Vinny Mancuso, Backstage Senior Editor and Professional Entertainment Obsessive. I'll be your guide through every corner of the creative industry with the help of some of your favorite stars. Here you'll find intimate, in-depth talks with today's most award-worthy names in film, television, and theater. Along the way, we'll get advice on living your best creative life, relatable stories of the highest highs and lowest lows, and maybe, just maybe, a rare peak in the envelope. So often I've seen actors go, I don't know what I'm doing, I don't believe this is wrong, the scene is wrong, I think, and it's just fear. You know, they blame the writing or they blame the summer. You can find, always find something to blame, but it's actually just fear of committing and jumping in and doing the scene, saying the words and, and looking the other person in the eyes and playing the scene. Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of In the Envelope, the Actors Podcast. I am your host, as always, Vinny Mancuso, Senior Editor at Backstage Magazine. And folks, we are firmly on the Emmys train. The Emmys train stops for no one. And you cannot talk about the Emmys without talking about HBO's Succession. And you definitely cannot talk about Succession without talking about Tom Wamscans. Sorry, I will be mispronouncing that several times throughout the podcast, but that's okay because Matthew McFadden is joining us today to talk about all things Tom. Uh, Matthew rules. Uh, anyone who's ever seen him in anything knows that, uh, whether that's on stage and theater, the screen, his iconic, painfully awkward Mr. Darcy, or Tom Wamscans. Wamscans. You know he is just a tremendously, tremendously talented actor, uh, and everything he had to say today about the ins and outs of how he and the entire ensemble of Succession navigates that wild, wild show, it's just very fascinating. Uh, he's so eloquent when he talks about craft and process and his career. It's just all wonderful. Uh, and let's get right into it. Here is Tom Homsgans himself, Matthew McFadden. For your Emmy consideration, HBO Max presents Hacks. Nominated for 17 Emmys, including Outstanding Comedy Series and Outstanding Lead Actress in a Comedy Series for Gene Smart. Don't miss the series critics call a triumph. All episodes now streaming on HBO Max. Matthew McFadden has always stood out from his peers. Accepted into the Royal Academy of Dramatic Art at 17, he spent years honing his craft on stage and in BBC dramas before garnering universal acclaim as Mr. Darcy in Joe Wright's Pride and Prejudice. For the past four years, McFadden has portrayed the endearingly conniving social climber Tom Wamscans on HBO's Succession, a role that just earned him his second Emmy nomination. Here is the great Matthew McFadden. How's it going, Matthew? How's it going? How's your uh, your day so far? My day so far is, um, yeah, I woke up a couple of hours ago. I'm caffeinated. Good. Good. Same. Same. Uh, Are you in New York? I am. I am in New York. Uh, oh, I'm in New Jersey, but, you know, I tell people I'm in New York. <laughs> it's, a lot, it's a lot easier to explain. Uh, we're a few weeks out from Emmy nominations. Uh, your your second Emmy nomination. Uh, so I'm curious, what you know, what is your typical Emmy nomination morning? Uh, how do you learn? How do you how do you get the news that you're nominated? Uh, what's that like? What's that morning like? What's your what's the, what's the usual sort of progression? The first time um, I got calls from my agents in the US and my UK agent, and they all rang at the same time. It was very nice, very exciting. And then the second time I was on a plane and I managed yeah. to get a bit of Wi-Fi. You know, when you buy your Wi-Fi package on the plane and I and um, I found out by text again from my lovely agent. 
Very nice. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm always curious because, you know, a lot of people that listen to this podcast, we are, you know, we're the backstage podcast. So a lot of our audience is, you know, aspiring actors, uh, early career actors. Uh, and I'm so, I'm just always curious, you know, this is such a broad question, but I do mean it specifically what it feels like to be nominated for an Emmy. You know, like, I, I think that people sort of have the, uh, broad view idea of what it might be like to be award nominated, but sort of like, you know, when you get the, the, someone tells you, Hey, uh, you acted in this show and now you're Emmy nominated, you're whatever nominated. What does that feel like? What is it? What does it feel like on a, on a sort of moment to moment level? Uh, I don't, I don't know. I mean, <laughs> the first time I was ever nominated for something, it was, uh, preposterously exciting. And, you know, I thought about it all the time and, and then inevitably, yeah, as the years go by, you know, it's not to sound ungracious or anything, but it just, it's just, not, it's, it's less exciting. It just is. It's just a, a, because you realize awards are just fun. You know, they're not, um, you know, I don't act to win awards or, I, you know, anyone who goes into acting to win awards is going to, is doing it for the wrong reasons, you know. Um, they're just a nice, it's a nice thing, you know. It's that, there's that funny quote, isn't there, that, that uh, we all know awards are silly, but if they're handing them out, I'll have one. You know, <laughs> I'll take one. Thank you very much. Um, but it's, you know, yeah, it's nice. School prizes. Yeah, exactly. Well, that is, that is, you know, that is what we are actually interested in is, you know, why acting? Why get into acting? So I do want to, you know, I want to sort of, I can't wait to talk about Succession. I cannot wait to talk about Succession season three, but I want to back it up a little bit to, you know, the entire progression of your career uh, to the beginning. And I'm wondering if you do have an acting sort of origin story. Uh, you know, the thing that you saw or the, the, the moment you had or the, anything that clicked where you were like, oh, that's that's acting. That's something I would like to do. I'm just going to go back to the awards thing because I don't I don't. It's very gratifying, you know, especially for the show as well. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't want to. I'm, I'm anxious that I don't sound sort of um, uh, ungracious or ungrateful. I, I, it's a lovely it's a lovely thing. But you sort of learn to keep it in perspective. I think that's what I was saying. You know, it's not <laughs> it's just a nice it's a treat. Uh, and as far as the beginning into acting, I just, it was a school, but it was the, probably the nativity play. And I was cast as one of the Kings in school. And I remember it was thrilling. And I thought I've been, I was cast as one of the wise men, which I thought was a nice part. It wasn't Jesus or Mary or Joseph. Um, but it was a, you know, he was a, he was, it was a crucial role. Um, and it was, and it was very exciting. And then I just thought I'm going to try and be in every school play from now on. And I just like being on stage and I think I was quite probably quite shy kid and um and I didn't feel shy on stage I sort of loved it I'm not sure why that is yeah and then as I got older and I just sort of you sort of it's a slow a sort of wondering and a imagining if I could possibly do this for you know professionally and then yeah I secretly sort of auditioned for drama school was applying to do drama at university at the same time and got into drama school. I didn't think I would. I thought it would take a few goes, but I got in the first time. I got in my first time of trying and that was that. And then I was at RADA and I was, I was 17. So I was very young. So that was it really. That was, that was how it sort of happened. Well, first of all, I love hearing that. I was also uh, one of the three kings in a nativity play. Uh, and I believe in eighth grade. You remember who you were? I don't. I remember that there was three bathrobes. I got the brown bathrobe. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> so whichever one no, I, I was, Casper, I think. Okay, Casper, Melchior, and some other guy. Can't remember his name, but I was Casper. I do remember that the 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 extreme lack of pressure from not being like you said you're 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 not you don't have the weight the weight of Je- yeah the weight of Jesus and Mary on you. Or the yeah, star. it's a big deal. But you can be quietly good as one of the kings. Yeah. But not be not have to carry the show. Well, I kind of love that through line because I feel like that <laughs> you think of uh, succession, you know, you are, you are, <laughs> the, the direct through line is like, you know, you are, it's an ensemble uh, and you are quietly good and you can, you can just sort of, you can carry the show, but you don't have to carry the show. I love that. This is it. Yeah. Um, you did mention, you know, you accepted to the Royal Academy of Dramatic Arts at, at, at 17, uh, quite young. I'm wondering at that point, um, what was your sort of view of acting as a career option versus like as, you know, artistic expression and like where you, where you were at at the time as, as, as how you saw acting in your life? 
I remember thinking, I couldn't believe that I got into RADA. Um, it was it was really probably one of the, like the red letter day of my life so far. I mean, apart from the kids being born and everything, but it was such a big deal, certainly at that age. And at that age, three years feels like a lifetime, that course. And so I was just sort of going day by day and it was so, you know, and it wasn't entirely happy at drama school because it was, you know, you leave school school and you've done lots of plays and you feel like you're good at what you're doing and it's, you know, and then you go to drama school and you're sort of picked apart often and, you know, they sort of break you down to build you up. So there was a lot of sort of learning and unlearning stuff and and then realising some stuff was sort of nonsense that they were teaching you, and, you know, uh, and all that. And, and also sort of learning how to be with your year group, many of whom had been to university and had jobs and were older than me. And, you know, I think the average age at my, in my year was maybe 20, 23, 24. So that, I was coping with that and, you know, and so... The, my philosophy of acting was sort of, I didn't know what it was really. I just, I loved my friends and I, we just, we watched lots of movies and that was when Reservoir Dogs came out and, you know, we were obsessed with all the old, you know, De Niro and Pacino and all those guys. And um, there was a film called State of Grace with Sean Penn and Gary Oldman and Ed Harris. And we, I remember watching that on a loop and we talked about it all the time. Brilliant movie. And yeah, talked a lot about read read a lot of read a lot of books about acting. Read a lot of there was a David Mamet book which we read a lot, and so there was a lot of talk. And we were taught the Uta Hagen method at RADA, which is um, a sort of version, you know. And so that that was quite a that was a big deal. That was a big steep sort of learning curve, and you sort of. But much like a painter, you learning techniques, you sort of learn what's useful to you and what isn't, and what works and what doesn't, and you realise that it's a sort of resource to be used when you need it, as opposed to a dogma, as a dogmatic way of going about mm. something. So that was that was um, a real learning curve. Uh, but that, but while you're in this, the idea of getting a job was so remote, you know, so unthinkable, mm-hmm. you know. So it was really going day by day. You mentioned, I find this really interesting, is that you're sort of, you know, at that point, you're kind of a, a, a rolling stone, you know, just gathering whatever, whatever sticks. I'm, I'm wondering what, you were drawn to the most and what has sort of stuck with you uh, still, you know, what you're sort of using uh, as you act today, as you get jobs today, what you're sort of still using from that time period, uh, even in things like succession and the things you're doing around succession. Um, I think the biggest influence on me as an actor was after RADA. I worked, I worked twice, three times actually with a director called Declan Donlan, who um, has a company called Cheek by Jowl. And they, my first job was Duchess of Malfi with Cheek by Jowl. And um, it was a world tour. It was like 10, 10 months, nine, 10 months tour. Uh, and Declan, Declan's sort of way of teaching and his philosophy of acting was the big, it was the, is the most sort of lasting influence about the way I approach a part and just the way I, the way I see telling a story and acting, which is, uh, not to do, which is to do with imagination and paying attention and it not being all about y- what's inside you because the idea is you're fed by external stimulus and not by something that you're sort of summoning up from inside. It's to do with what you're seeing mm-hmm. and then you're trying to change what you see. And um, so it was him really. He's written, he wrote a wonderful book called The Actor and the Target, um, uh, and that's a really good, if anyone's interested in that sort of way of going about it, that's, that's a wonderful book. Um, so it was that really, rather than anything at drama school, I'd say. Interesting. Mm-hmm. And quite a lot of the stuff that we learned at drama school, you know, I thought the voice teaching was wonderful and we, uh, everything was sort of underpinned. There was a lot of Alexander technique, which was great because it was the only discipline which sort of bled into everything else, voice and movement and all the rest of it. Um, but it was good. I loved Rana. But I would say that my my yeah my acting technique is a, a, I, I think of Declan when I get stuck. I, when I ask these questions throughout this podcast, I I, I look for the stuff that people um, you know that say they say the most. And a thing I hear a lot is that actors should do live theater um, because a lot of people I talk to they say I learned what I learned and what I still use by doing live theater. 
uh, and you you had an extensive time on stage. Uh, you know, you mentioned cheek by cheek by jowl, and uh, just from you know ninety two to I believe like ninety six, you were you were working on stage. And I'm I, I'm curious now that you've sort of more known for 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 TV. Um, what's the overlap there in terms of building a character, in terms of living with a character? What you're still sort of using uh, just from your time, what you learned on stage uh, and from being on stage that that is sort of still driving what you do. I think the thing with on stage, I don't I, uh, living. I don't try and live with the character. I I think you're you, on stage. You're just you're communing with a with a. You're in a room with with these people, and you're sort of it. It lasts from when you, you you walk on stage and you're on, and then you're off. And I'm quite rigorous about that. You're either on or off. It's a mask, you know. Mm-hmm. I don't walk around. I mean, if I, I'm sure there's lots of things going on in my subconscious, and I'm I'm a great believer in that. There's a lot of work being done subconsciously, just because my imagination's working, and my, every, our our imagination is very powerful. And I think that's you know that's our biggest, that's our strongest tool as an actor, probably. But um, I, for me, it's mask on, mask off. Mm-hmm. That's it. I don't, I don't get mixed up with me and the character. And mm-hmm. I think that's sort of silly um, and undisciplined in a way. And I think theatre gives you that. You do eight shows a week and you're on tour around the world. You know, I'm, I can't be walking around as Antonio from the Duchess of Malfi in, <laughs> you know, <laughs> in, in Blackpool. Yeah. You know, on a wet Tuesday afternoon looking for my digs, you know. <laughs> exactly. It's ridiculous. Um but when you're on stage, it's total concentration and you're entirely focused on the person you're acting with on stage in that moment. Uh that's when it counts. Uh and that's when you're playing your action or you're listening or you're, you know, all the rest of it. Um and I think I don't know, I think I'm a great believer in the fact that it's you know, when you do a play or you make a TV show or a film, it's a collective endeavor. It's, it doesn't work on your own, you know. And I've seen people, tr- you know, I've seen often people trying to do it on their own. The results are never successful or interesting in my, in my experience. And, um, you know, and you can't... And doing a, doing a play is a collective. It's, you need the other people you need and you need the audience. And so... Mm-hmm. And I see that with Succession. It's wonderful. It's an ensemble piece. You know, we're all... And especially the way Succession is written, you know, and shot. You know, we have these wonderful long scenes... Um, and it is a bit like doing a play. It's really thrilling because you're all, you know, you're, you're just, you're hanging on, you, you know, the technical thing is you're waiting for the cue. So, you, you know, so you're, you're entirely 100% focused on the person you're acting with um, because it's, you know, it's a 10 page scene and you can't <laughs> let the ball drop, you know. That was, was that's actually something that really struck me. I, I, as you know, prepare for this interview. I rewatched Succession season three, and you know, was really just sort of trying to. And I, something I didn't really quite grasp in the first watch was how long some of the scenes are, which is such a, you know, normally, normally that's death for TV. You know, normally like that, that, that's you know, people tune out. But with Succession, it's like you said, it's it's sort of watching the, the rise and fall of it, the progression of it. Um, it's quite gladiatorial, to... isn't it? I mean, I think people get scared. People think, oh, we're going to have to cut away. We have to cut to a car crash. We have to cut to this. You know, people are going to get bored. But I think, I, I don't know. I think if the writing's good and the story's good enough, it's it's sort of thrilling. And you go, I mean, I remember, you know, watching a lot of these, uh, I think films as well, those 70s films, you know, they were long. And the camera mm-hmm. wasn't afraid just to stay. You know, you watch The Godfather now and they... You know, these these lo- big wide shots, and they're they're just kept like that for a long time. You know, it's sort of thrilling um, yeah. because we're so used to sort of endless close-ups without having earned them. It's actually I feel it's like something new. I I feel like I remember seeing someone say this. It's like I I miss when movies were made of scenes. You know, because it does it kind it doesn't really feel like things these days. It's, it almost feels like the whole movie is a montage because it never it never stays. Yeah, still. yeah without exactly. that. Yeah, but yeah, that's something that's a, that succession especially really thrives in. Uh, is just you know scenes having <laughs> scenes where within that scene there is almost a, a three act structure where there's up and down and there's so I'm curious you know on the day you obviously you know you have the blocking the script everything you have but but what that what that technical process is like is sort of living in a scene when from your perspective there's setups there's there's cut action stuff like that um, how you navigate that day to day. Well, I think that's just a that's just a sort of function of you know you you work out you know the scene's coming up in a few days, so you look at it and learn your lines, and you sort of have an idea of how you might 
be in the scene, I suppose. But it's all vague and half formed. Mm-hmm. And then you do a te- you do a rehearsal. You know, typically we'll do a rehearsal with the director, and the DP will be there. Maybe the DP won't be there at the beginning, but we'll sort of block it out and work it out, especially if it's a long scene. And then the DP will come and the camera guys will come and have a look and then we'll just sort of slowly work it out. You know, we'll block it through. But we don't, we don't do an awful lot of rehearsal in succession, which is sort of weird to think about because um, mm-hmm. they're quite complicated scenes. <laughs> yeah, that is genuinely... Surprising. We just sort of jump in and, and a lot of it is, is sort of thanks to how technically brilliant our camera operators are and our technical crew is because they just sort of come in with us and they're shooting and finding and going with it. And, and, um, and also it's, the scenes are so beautifully written and structured that actually they sort of do a lot of it for you. You know, there isn't, I've never, I've never thought, Oh God, how are we going to make this scene work? You know, it's a really cumbersome Uh. and difficult spot. They just sort of go, you go, okay, this is, this is perfect. This is, it's sort of looking after you. Mm. I say that a lot, but it's, I really believe it. When, when good writing sort of looks after you as long as you commit to it. Mm. It's like Shakespeare. If you, if you dither and you sort of hang back and you're on the back foot, it'll really fuck you up. Yeah. But if you jump in and commit, then it's a wonderful thing because it sort of looks after you the rhythm of the verse will look after you and, you know, it'll, it's sort of propulsive. And, and I think that's sort of true with good writing. I love that. It's, and it's scary to do because it's, because you, because you think I'm going to make a tit of myself, you know, mm-hmm. especially with cla- classical theatre or something, you know, um, we're very lucky yeah. with this show, I think. For your Emmy consideration, HBO presents Euphoria. Nominated for 16 Emmys, including Outstanding Drama Series and Outstanding Lead Actress in a Drama Series for Zendaya. Don't miss what critics call a bold and original series. Euphoria is now streaming on HBO Max. I do want to get just right into into succession because this this as you might have told this show fascinates me uh the way it's shot the way it's the way it just comes together. Uh I do want to get into it uh from by telling you a quote from uh, a fellow Mr. Darcy, Colin Firth. Yeah. Uh, in, he, he said this to Vanity Fair, and I thought it was really fascinating. He said this about your role in Succession. Uh, the quote is, I can't see him anywhere in it, and I don't know where it came from. <laughs> uh, <laughs> which I find so interesting. You know, like, the, the idea of knowing someone personally and being like, I can't see that person uh, in this performance. Um, so, I guess, broadly, uh, where, where did Tom come from i don't know i mean it must i mean it is in me but i don't know that's the lovely that's the lovely thing about it i mean it's just i guess i don't know i mean tom wasn't when in the pilot he was initially he was a sort of old older character what am i 47 now so when we started i was sort of 43 or something so, but Tom in the in the pilot was maybe 55 i think he was a bit older not that i played him like that but that was my sort of and he was, I think he was sort of, I don't, I don't know. He sort of, you, I think Jesse sort of discovered something maybe about Tom from the pilot that watching me playing it and the same with all the characters and then extrapolated and built on that as the show went on. But there must be a Wamsgans jumping around inside me somewhere, which I've managed to, <laughs> <laughs> managed to locate and, you know, and he's sort of, he's flourished. But I don't know. I mean, it's a great liberation playing an American mm-hmm. for me. My voice goes into a different register often. With this, and it's great. And it, it's like putting on a big hat or a, a very colorful suit. You sort of forget yourself because it's so yeah. different. The rhythm of speech is so different from my own. Um, and so it's very, it's very liberating. It's very, it makes me unselfconscious because I, because it's so different, you know. I was actually going to ask you about that, um, and I think it's, I think I'm allowed to say this as as as, as an American. I, I, I something I find yeah, my accent I, is terrible. Well, it was not even about the accent. It's it's the it's the sheer just like Americanness of the of the character. Like I, <laughs> really, I, I yeah, like I just there's just like a I, I think that again I, as people discover this show, I think that something that comes up a lot is the surprise uh, that you're not American, uh, and I think that's that's not even just the accent. It's the 
it just sort of it it feels lived in in a way that is real to a sort of very American brand of ambition and desperation and also empathy. Look, that's the most lovely thing you could say. That's the biggest compliment you could say, really. That's wonderful. Yeah, absolutely. And I know, I know that's a that's sort of a heavy setup to any <laughs> to any question. Um, but I am, you know, I, I, I would love to know just sort of, you know, I, in practicing, in, in, like you mentioned, it's like putting on a hat, in practicing the accent and, you know, sort of slipping on the role as a, as costuming, um, what you found from that uh, in terms of interpreting this character full bore. I think inevitably we're suffused with American culture in the UK and, you know, everybody is in films and movies and TV and I have been, you know, all my life. And so stuff goes in and then you, you know, you get an opportunity to sort of do something like this and, and, and so it just sort of comes out without you knowing it. I'm a great believer in, stu- in, in, you know, it's, I, when I'm, I don't know, it's, it's odd, it's odd acting because you can do research and you work, but I, the, so much of the work is, is done without you really knowing it, you know, as long as you keep your imagination open. That's, I'm, be, I'm being terribly inarticulate, but it's, you know, when I work on a part, I don't sort of sit down and go, right, I'm going to do this and do this. I just sort of try mm-hmm. and um, keep an open mind and think what would happen if I did this or what, what about this or, you know, and sort of, I don't try and, I don't try and commit to things or make decisions until the last minute, I suppose. So I guess, I don't know. And as an actor, you're constantly observing and watching and, you know, you're sort of a magpie. So you think, oh, maybe I'll use that in that scene, that little thing I saw on someone do on CNN or I don't know, whatever it is or, you know. And so it all just comes out, you know. And it helps being on set with lots of brilliant American actors. So you nick stuff all the time, you pinch ideas uh-huh. and expressions and, you know. Um, and now and again, you know, Nick or Alan or Kieran or someone will say, that sounds a bit strange. <laughs> Well, it's it's interesting. You mentioned before the the, the idea of um, you know working working near your subconscious. You know, uh, is it a matter of sort of at a certain point trusting, having trust in yourself? Um, because I think uh, that's something that a lot of actors would probably have to get over is 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 not committing to something before and and committing to the idea that you're not quite sure how it's going to come out or or you're not quite sure where it's go- where it's going to come from. Exactly, that's exactly right, and that's why acting's hard. Otherwise, everybody would do it because it's a really nice job. Um, it's a really nice way to, to uh, you know, but that's why acting is hard because it's simple and it's scary because you have to just um, jump in. You have to trust. You have to not worry about what you're doing. You have to trust in the person you're acting with. Mm-hmm. You have to trust in the material. So often I've seen actors go, I don't know what I'm doing. I don't believe this is wrong. The scene is wrong. And it's just fear, you know. They blame the writing or they blame the summer. You can find, always find something to blame, but it's actually just fear of committing and jumping in and doing the scene, saying the words and, and looking the other person in the eyes and playing the scene. Mm-hmm. And it's really simple, but it's difficult. <laughs> so you create all this other business as actors. You do, you know, you get it. You have a costume and you thing and you get some props and you whatever, you know, to try and make yourself less scared. But, the, but you just make yourself more frightened. Really, you just need to, to jump in. I think that's, and that ties in with a lot of, you know, people who've worked with Declan or read his book will, will recognize that, you know, it's the first thing your actor says who's, who's, you think, well, I don't know what I'm doing. Mm-hmm. And I think, you know, your, your security as an actor comes in, in trusting the other person you're working with as well. That's the other, because they, I've said this before and it probably, you know, probably a boring thing to say and it's an obvious thing to say, but if I'm doing a scene with, you know, Jeremy or Sarah or Brian, their ca- you know their character. They their I look into their eyes and they will tell me how to be as Tom or as whoever. And that's my you know that that's my inner life is looking at Jeremy or Sarah or Brian in the scene because they're giving me everything I need. I'm not summoning up anything from within. It's all coming from external stimulus and you know. I'll jump, you know, Nick, Nick Braun and I will jump into a scene, you know, one of those Tom and Greg scenes, which are just joyful. And inevitably in rehearsal or as we're talking and we're waiting for the lighting to happen and all the rest of it, things will come out and we say, let's try this or let's do this. Um, but that comes from not working anything out before. 
that comes from just being with Nick and paying attention to him in the scene. And, you know, he'll see something I might want to do and he'll sort of encourage me to do it and vice versa. And, but it's scary to do that because you think, well, I'm going to just turn up and hope for the best. Mm-hmm. But something always comes in when you trust in the material and your fellow actor. Anyway, I'm saying the same thing, but I'm, I'm sorry <laughs> if I'm waffling. No, it's all fascinating, though. Uh, genuinely, it's, I, it's, that's stuff that, you know, I, I had never heard before uh the the idea of you know the idea of getting your in your character's internal life from the external circumstances is is is, is fascinating. totally because there is nothing inside us you know mm-hmm. we wake up and you know as actors you sort of you, you know you you think oh, i've got to you know we don't walk around in states of rage or sorrow or joy or you know we we sort of walk around pretty neutral most of the day instead of the characters we play and then you find you go from nothing to 100 miles an hour in a second and that's you know, that comes from something you've seen or something that's, you know, not necessarily, I mean, it can be something you've thought about, but the thought comes from when you're on stage or in front of a camera, it has to come from something you're seeing. Otherwise, it's boring. Mm-hmm. Because the audience, you're not letting the audience in, it's a technical thing. Absolutely. I do want to ask uh, about one specific succession, season three, scene from the finale. Um, and that's the the last scene of the season. Uh, and again, if someone's listening to this, you know, hasn't seen Succession yet, this this is a spoiler. Um, but it it is that something I find fascinating just in general about Succession is how it's 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 almost all you know subtext. It's all people saying one thing and meaning another. And in this final scene, when Tom you know sort of makes his play and and, and betrays his wife and 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 aligns with Logan, uh, it's all done. You get all that from gestures and what's not being said and you know you get everything you get a a a season cliffhanger without it being explained to you basically yes uh so you mentioned you know the writing and the rehearsal and everything that happens on set so i'm curious specifically a scene like that for you um how does that come about uh in terms of everything you've you've said before how do you how do you bring that that sort of all the weight of the entire season to the forefront without anything being said well, you don't. That's the thing. Because if you, if I thought about that, I would throw myself off the Tuscan balcony where we were <laughs> filming. I, I remember that was a, it was a long scene, but it was like a must have been a ten-page scene, nine pages of which, nine and a half pages of which I wasn't in, and I just come in at the end. And so, like I was saying, you, I mean, it was quite extraordinary to walk into that room after you know but the atmosphere was so charged. It was sort of amazing. I think, my God. But my job as Matthew playing Tom was just to walk in and look after Shiv and, mm-hmm. uh, and trust in the writing and trust in the storytelling and allow the audience to project whatever they want onto me and Sarah and whatever, you know. So I was literally just doing what the character does, which is come in solicitously and make sure everything's okay and is what's happened and honey uh how are you you know because i don't know that she's seen me with logan Mm -hmm. i don't think i've seen her see me so as far as i'm concerned uh, or everything's okay so i literally just did did what was in the stage directions and inevitably yeah things come out or you know but that's sort of out of my hands you just trust that the audience, you trust that, the, you know, you trust, I trust in Jesse and Mark Mylod, the director, and you trust that the audience will, will be with you. And again, that ties in with, with you know, it's sometimes it's scary because you think, God, what if they don't, what if they're not understanding? What if I'm not feeling stuff? What if I'm not doing enough? You know, that's all bullshit. You just have to do what the character does. Character is action. That's Sophocles, Sophocles is it? Or Socrates? Oh, oh I have, one of those I have, guys. Yeah. <laughs> character is action. You are as you do. And so you do what the character does. And then the feeling, you not worry about the feeling or not worry about the emotion because that's not interesting. Mm-hmm. It's, the, it's the action which is interesting. It's the doing. And so, yeah, that was it. I love that. There's, it sounds like just like, you know, a tremendous amount of trust all around. You know, trust in yourself, trust in the audience, trust in the Yeah, way. otherwise you're doing, you're, you're, yeah. I don't know how to do it. You, you, you know, I just stop, stop buffering. Because you think, I can't, I can't engender all this stuff. I can't act all this stuff. I just have to play the scene as written and trust that everything, you know, trust that Mark's looking after it from a directorial point of view and, you know, 
And often he'll, you know, he'll come in and say, let's do this or let's try this. Let's sort of dial it up or down or, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But again, that's, the that. you know, it's simple but difficult. And di yeah. difficult because it's so simple. I love the idea you're like, oh, you know, it's, it's simple, but if it was actually simple, everybody would do it. <laughs> <'Cause> <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah, it's, yeah. It's actually tremendously, nearly impossible hard. Yeah, yeah. Um, but so before I let you go, this was this was an absolute uh, pleasure. Uh, we do have this these these series of questions called the Backstage Five. Uh, you know, it's, it's it's five questions. They're sort of rapid fire. Um, they're questions we ask everybody because it's sort of a all encompassing of an actor's career. Uh, so yeah, five questions, rapid fire. Number one: uh, What is one performance that every actor should see and why? Oh God, that's a killer question. <laughs> <laughs> I should have done. I want to say. Um... That's a terrible question. That's so hard. <laughs> That's breaking my heart. Should have, I don't know. Uh, Al Pacino sorry. in Dog Day Afternoon. Yeah, incredible answer. I mean, that, but that's I could keep going. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, I mean, it's 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 a good place to start. It's a good place, definitely a good place to start. Yeah. Um, number two, what is the wildest thing you've ever done to get a role? Oh, I haven't really done very much. I I drunkenly faxed a director demanding a role, <laughs> and it worked. There you go. Uh, can't can't say I recommend doing it. But <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It did work. So. <laughs> it was short and sweet and to the point and very drunk. Yeah, back in the days Amazing. when the fax machines were all <laughs> <laughs> yeah, in vogue. That, that kind of date. That kind of dates the story. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, number three. Do you have an audition horror story that you can share with us? Um, <laughs> I auditioned for Robert De Niro. <laughs> it's not really a horror story. I auditioned for Robert De Niro in London for a film called The Good Shepherd and it, it, it the first I, the first audition the first time around was really good and I got called back the same day and it was really bad it was really he was yeah, it's it's a lot to go into but it was really excruciating um, amazing yeah it was excruciating it went from really good to really <laughs> shitty <laughs> yeah. that sounds like um the whole thing. That sounds like it was really good and then it was really bad. Yeah, it was really bad. It was really bad. Yeah, I can't go into it, but it was... Yeah. <laughs> um, question number four. How did you get your SAG or equity membership? Um, my equity membership... Uh, it, I, I can't remember how it worked. The equity just comes through after a while. So, uh, I think I had to be a SAG member to start working in the States. Mm -hmm. I don't know is the answer. Sorry, that's a bit of a vague, boring. Equity used to be a closed shop, so you had to work for 52... You had to work for a year to get a card, but you couldn't work unless you had a card. So that was a sort of catch-22 thing, but that would have gone by the time I started, so... Good place to be in. You know, it just sort of, <laughs> just sort of worked out. Um, and question number five, what is the number one piece of advice you would give your younger self? Um... I would, or I think I would have said take a, take a few more risks. Take a few more risks, I suppose. Um, but then I don't know. I don't know. That's a difficult. Take a few more risks. Maybe try a few more different things. You know, I some I had I think my I sometimes I would be a bit sort of um, I would be a bit uh, standoffish about certain roles or parts, and I think that was just fear. I was worried I wouldn't get it or I wouldn't be very good. And so I didn't really commit to it, to the audition or to the, and I wish I'd been a bit braver and, you know, not been so standoffish and maybe snobby about things. But it really, that all came from my own worry and fear about failing, I suppose. Amazing. Well, that is the backstage five. Uh, Matthew, thank you so much for being here. Uh, this was, an, this was an absolute pleasure. And like Me I too. said, Succession season three, uh, just a joy. It's 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 pretty much unlike anything else on TV right now, uh, and I, I I can't I can't say enough kind things about it. And, You're very uh, lovely. Uh, thank you, thank you so much for being here, and we will be watching on Emmy's night. Fantastic, thank you so Amazing. much. Thanks, as always, to our brilliant producer, Jamie Muffet, and to the whole team at Backstage, Samantha Sherlock, Mark Stinson, Caitlin Watkins, and of course, Casey Howe. Visit Backstage.com, and don't forget, you can subscribe to Backstage with code ENVELOPE at checkout for a free trial. 100% free, you simply cannot beat that. For more exclusive content, find us on Facebook and Twitter at In the Envelope, and subscribe, share, and leave a comment. 
Who should we interview next to let us know? Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you next time for another peek in the envelope.